So I've got a few loaded up over the last couple of weeks since I've been traveling, but this is one I showed a couple of months ago and I'm going to revisit it because we have more information now. This is a patient who's neutropenic and they had this radiograph and you can see there's this rounded consolidation or rounded opacity peripherally. And when I showed this, we were I was just showing how pretty this bird's nest appearance is, as you can see here, and it's kind of got that reverse halo that we often associate with mucor more than other angioinvasive fungal species. And there's also some just centrolobular nodules throughout the rest of the, the lungs. But this evolved over a few, a few days, and this was a, a CT with contrast. And you can see similar findings, and there's just essentially abrupt cutoff of the vessels going into this thing. It was kind of interesting too that it was crossing the fissure and involving both the right middle lobe and the right and the right upper lobe. Jeff, do you see that it's interesting? I just upgraded to the new um, the new version, and that little thumbnail is popping up. Is that, is that oh, doing that for you? Cross reference, yeah. That's a new feature on the uh, multiplaners. Oh. It shows you, yeah, yeah. So you can see how it's it's it was crossing the fissure and involving the right middle lobe and right upper lobe, but. Anyway, to make a long story short, when I showed this, we were saying that most likely you see this with mucor, but the patient had had a bronch and had a positive aspergillus PCR or something out of this. But anyway, they went to do they went to VATS and resected this, and it's in, the pathology was interesting. It did involve both lobes, the right upper and mid, upper and middle lobes, and they found basically everything in it. There was mucor, so in fact, this was a mucor bird's nest, which not surprising. Then they found some candida within it, and then they also found a little bit of uh, aspergillus small. There was a focal small abscess, so that's where the aspergillus came from. So, you know, as we said before, you know, most of the time, this bird's nest appearance is going to be mucor, and that's what this turned out to be. So just a really I, pretty I example of it. The path report says something about papillary thyroid cancer meds. Is that what all the little nodules are? I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, there were some other right small nodules that were persistent there. So yeah, a bunch of a bunch of everything in this. So okay, next one. This is kind of a, a I'm trying to show just some basic stuff today. This is a patient who had end stage re or end stage fibrosis and lung disease, and you can see there's air trapping. And so this was this was hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but it's not why I show it. I want to show you the post single lung transplant that they did, and this is kind of cool because here they've done a right lung transplant, and then you can see end stage lung disease in the left. You see in the transplanted right lung that there are some very ill-defined, smudgy centrolobular nodules, mostly in the upper lobe, as you can see here. And I think that, you know, which you know, normally when we see, we think of RB if the patient's a smoker, maybe HP. But as you can see there, well, there was, I thought there was a staple line in the, trans, in the donor lung. But anyway... They did do a biopsy of the, the donor lung in a couple of places, because I guess they saw these on a preoperative scan. And this turned out to all be respiratory bronchiolitis. I guess the donor was a smoker. So it's a path-proven case of just small centrolobular nodules in respiratory bronchiolitis. And it was nice to have that history, because when we saw this on the initial post-transplant study, you know, it was a little confusing because it was in the acute setting. This in the transplant was a while ago. I only show the most recent one just because it's the best example of it. But we don't always get path on respiratory bronchiolitis just because it's so common in smokers. But in this case, we did have path on it. Hmm. And <clears throat> now this case, this is a fun one. So this is one I saw over the holidays. And this patient came into the ED with cough. And my resident had commented on some nodules bilaterally, thought maybe the patient could have a viral pneumonia or something. And what bothered me when I saw this was there was this more discreet nodule here that I couldn't, you know, thought maybe it was an additional focus of infection or, or whatever, but it's a little worrisome because it was more discreet. Now, I think in retrospect, when you look at this, you see the symmetry of everything up here and you think maybe there's some bronchial walls that are thickened and maybe some little holes in here. 
but they eventually did get a CT. And, and you can see that the upper lobe stuff, typical of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So we have some bizarre shaped cysts. We have some small little nodules. I don't know if any of them made nice Cheerios in this case, but maybe you know, starting to right in here, but you see these upper lobe predominant nodules. And then the, the thing that caught my eye on the radiograph was this nodule, which certainly looks morphologically different than everything else. And just to, to answer everybody's burning question that yes, the Langerhans does spare the tips of the right middle lobe and the lingula and the lower lobes like we think. And then there was also this other nodule right here, which is kind of mixed solid and ground glass, which kind of blew off. But anyway, they went to Bronk and they sampled this and got neuroendocrine cells from it, which was kind of interesting. And so they eventually went and did a left lower lobectomy. And you'll see in the path that they had the mixed solid and ground glass nodule was an adenocarcinoma. That tubular thing was a carcinoid. And then everything else was Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So the patient had two different cancers in that left lower lobe, plus some Langerhans cell histiocytes as well. So wow. just kind of, you know, it's a nice radiograph. I think in retrospect, maybe if I'd known that the patient was a smoker, I would have, you know, and if you know that the symptoms are more subacute, then you could suggest Langerhans cell. But I think this was what caught my eye and what prompted everything else. It was kind of bizarre. And there was no, there was no, uh, like, there was no uh, uh, dipnic or anything else. It was just that one carcinoid tumor in the lower lobe. So interesting uh, case of multiple different things. Jeff, let me know how many I should show because I don't know how many people we have this week. I, I've got, as you can see, I've got a whole list. Cases, David. I take it you have cases. Just one. All right. <laughs> we can always come back around. Yeah. Let me. I'll do one or two more. This one's kind of interesting. That, and this is a patient who they presented in 2017. I'm just going to start at the beginning though, and they had this stuff in the left upper lobe, and you can see it's there's a little bit of maybe a little bit of scar and architectural distortion with those little reticular opacities. And then there's a couple of calcified nodules. And then it's just a little cluster of, I don't know if you describe those as little ill-defined nodules, but it almost looks, it almost looks like a, you know, kind of a galaxy sign up here. You get the sense maybe there's just small little nodules coalescing there. And you can see it's got a couple of calcified nodes here. And so th this was on the outside and they said, oh, maybe, you know, could be an adenocarcinoma or it could just be scar because they thought I think it was more ground glass opacity. And then you can fast forward a couple years and we'll see that this area has become a lot more expansive. And I think here it does look like small little nodules that are coalescing. It's asymmetric. The patient didn't have a history of sarcoid and this was still done elsewhere. And so they this eventually prompted a PET CT. This was in December of 2016. And no surprise on the PET that this area was hot, as you can see right in here. And so that eventually prompted a biopsy that was non-diagnostic, and so they kept on following it. But what's interesting is then in the past, last summer when they finally came to us, now they have still all of this stuff up here that's a little bit more confluent and they've developed a left pleural effusion. And you can see the pleural effusion is a little bothersome because you've got some, what looks like nodular pleural thickening along the medial pleural surface. And so I think there was still, <clears throat> still a suspicion that this could be uh, a lung malignancy now with spread to the pleura. Uh, but this ended up, they ended up undergoing a VATS biopsy of the pleura. And as you will see, it this all turned out to be tuberculosis, that the patient had TB and then presumably then spread to the and seeded the pleura, that these were all little, uh, you know, nodular disease caking the entire surface, and it was all MTB. So it's, it was over the course of four years that all this stuff developed in the lung, and I guess 
they were never treated or never had a PPD at the outside hospital. But this is one of the better examples, I think, of, of nodular pleural studying I've seen from infection, because usually, you know, this would be scariest for cancer for sure, given these little plaque-like appearance of it. Can, but, you see, can you see the pleural nodules here on the CT? Yeah, I think like I think along the medial pleural surface, all of this stuff, you know, yeah, certainly is certainly right. is scary. I mean, that looks like early mesothelioma or, sure or metastatic disease. Yeah. So they, as you can see from the report too, they went to biopsy, they went to the pleural biopsy with the intention to pleural these because of this new effusion. And then of course they said, you know, no cancer and they decided not to pleural these, you know, which makes sense since this is all just pleural tuberculosis and presumably from airway tuberculosis. And it's kind of, you know, it's pretty interesting, I think on some of these older CTs that it does look more galaxy-ish with just small little coalescent granulomas. Very sarcoid-like if you would see it in both sides. So, and I will show one more. I think Howard would like this one because it's a nice radiograph case. This is a radiograph that I saw and the history was asthma and chronic cough. And I'll let you look at it for a second. But what caught my eye was right in here, and especially because it looked like there was stuff over the arch and maybe anteriorly as well on the lateral view. And so I thought maybe this was pneumonia in the acute setting. I called the clinician and it sounded like he didn't really have active signs or symptoms of pneumonia, but he wasn't asthmatic and he'd been coughing up brown stuff. And so I said, well, I mean, ABPA, maybe we're just not seeing bronchiectasis elsewhere. So he underwent a CT. And you'll see that he does, in fact, have stuff in that right upper lobe. And it's confined to the, you know, it's confined to the right upper lobe. And there's nice little tree and bud nodules in some of these areas. You can see the branching morphology. And when you look on soft tissue windows, you can see that he does, in fact, have high attenuation mucus as well, more centrally. And so what's interesting, though, is that's the only portion of his lung that's involved. He doesn't have any bronchiectasis, any mucus impaction anywhere else, but it's still more of that central, you know, segmental, proximal, subsegmental airways that are involved. And with the high attenuation mucus certainly suggests that this is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And so he went to bronch and they um, were able to, here you'll see, they there was a bunch of brown plugs that they took out and this was this all had aspergillus in it and so this was this was more of a localized abpa in his right upper lobe but i think and you can see on this follow-up study so he's been on steroids and after they cleaned out that bronchus that you know that it, things have substantially improved and he's left with just very mild focal bronchiectasis there so i don't you know, occasionally we see it asymmetric. I'm just curious if you guys have ever seen ABPA just in one lobe like this. I have one example, I think, Travis, and it was right upper lobe too. Yeah. Right, right upper lobe is the most common common site. So it, I've seen it in several cases that's unilateral, at least on radiographs. Okay. <clears throat> was, he, was there a background of asthma in this person? Oh yeah, he had, right. And that was the only thing you know, when I called him and he said he had asthma since he was a child. And he was now coughing up some brown sputum and stuff. So almost like a cast, yeah. Very nice. So, and it's, yeah, and I think we all, people will describe tree and bud in, in the setting of ABPA. I think we usually don't see it, you know, unless it's, because we, we usually think of just larger airways that are filled. But I thought this was a good example of that as well. And just also a reminder to always look for the high attenuation mucus that's fairly specific, even though we don't often see it. So, okay, I'll stop there for now, Jeff. All right, thank you. All right, uh, David, you said you had one? I do have a case here. Um, yes, indeed. Can people see a radiograph? We can. Uh, slightly smudgy, low-grade stuff here on the right, farther down on the right left base, maybe a few little extra things through here. 
And this person, I don't, I don't know whether the symptoms had begun at this point, probably because of the uh, radiograph was obtained, but just a week later, things are dramatically worse. We have all of this, really a ton of consolidation now. Same mid-lung and basal distribution, patch here, so forth, lateral view, doesn't really add much. Question of pleural effusion on this because we have blunted costophrenic angles, but it could just be low volume. And uh, this was followed by CT, which shows all of these blobs here. Uh, some of them seem to be associated with airways like this one and this one, but a lot of them are peripheral as well. Basal predominant, um, things get worse and worse down here. A lot of peripheral stuff. Indeed, there is pleural effusion on both sides, small pleural effusions, biggish heart, um, and some lymphadenopathy. And the uh, person was bronched, and the lesions were lavaged, and they recovered 20% eosinophils from the lavage and made a diagnosis of an eosinophilic pneumonia. As far as I can tell from the workup that I've seen to this point, there is no clear reason for this person to have an eosinophilic pneumonia. I don't think they related to anything specific. He was found to have um, suspicious um, T cell clonality and stuff. So there was a referral to our cancer branch here and they decided he probably did not have a malignancy with his T cell uh, problem. And, um, and the lymphadenopathy went away as with his lung disease as it went away with steroid therapy. So, and he used pneumonia and no clear cause. I don't recall seeing very many cases of eosinophilic pneumonia that had associated pleural effusion. I know I've seen it at least once. They also didn't diagnose any eosinophilic syndrome, you know, um, related to um, you know, Church Strauss or something like that. So it's just an isolated eosinophilia. The peripheral blobs, basal predominant, go nicely with an acute eosinophilic pneumonia, but some of the central lobular things um, don't quite fit. So lots of eosinophilia, and it, it was steroid responsive, and the trigger is not known at this point. Huh. I was almost thinking that this, this could be a disseminated um, uh, parasitic infection, like a, a Strongy hyperinfection or something. Yeah, with it's the not, tiny little nodules. Yeah, it's not quite as as ARDS -y as that usually turns out to be. It's more more discrete blobs in the cases I've seen. But yeah, it's a, a, a parasitic infection could be the trigger. And you know, a lot of these cases of eosinophilic pneumonia, they never know what really set it off. I don't think there was any provocative travel history to go with it. Uh, it was the lymphadenopathy that I think had people uh, worried about um, some sort of underlying lymphoma or something like that, which can drive an eosinophilic pneumonia, but that did not pan out. So are you, I'm just curious, like the nomenclature, so are you saying this is an acute eosinophilic pneumonia like you often see with new onset of smoking or more of a just chronic eosinophilic no, I think, pneumonia? I think it's acute. In, uh, the lung findings are acute are consistent with acute. You saw the way the chest radiograph changed over a week. Yeah. And it's basal predominant with the uh, the chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, so the ones that tend to migrate toward the apices and right. have peripheral apical distribution, like a cloak draped over the shoulders. And uh, this one with the peripheral blobs that are, you know, basal and lower lung predominant is the pattern I've seen with, you know, acute eosinophilic pneumonias. So smoking is not the only uh, cause of eosinophilic pneumonia. The other Very way to cool. if you don't make a diagnosis is drug induced. So either trying to get right. a detailed history of a new prescription drug or perhaps an, an illicit drug could mm -hmm. trigger an acute eosinophilic. And usually you would think you might get that history, but sometimes people forget the medications they take or they took something new one time. Right. And they forget about it. Who knows? But that's always something to think about. Yeah. And a few years ago, there were people who were taking. Um, they were getting these supplements that um, were very potent causes of eosinophilic pneumonia. I can't remember what they were. Um, I don't know whether they had some tyramine in them or something like that, but some people were getting supplements, which they don't consider to be medications, by the way. So when you ask about medications, you also have to ask about supplements as a separate issue. Yep. Um, Howard, since you're on the line, 
apropos of a case I uh, wanted to show today but didn't have time to work it out. Um, you said before in the Sjogren's people who have light chain deposition disease that you mentioned marginal cell lymphoma as being um, a common histology. And that fits with a couple of cases that I've seen, people who had uh, amyloidosis associated with you know, light chains and uh, they had marginal zone lymphomas. Is there something specific about the marginal zone in, in the lymph node that predisposes to protein deposition? No, I don't think so. I think it's just the concern that when patients with, say, Sjorgen syndrome present with opacities, yeah, that, and sometimes they don't have to even have opacities, but just cysts even, that they, a small number of patients will have a concurrent marginal zone lymphoma. And okay. sometimes that's an unanticipated finding when a, when a biopsy is done. Okay. And it's always a little bit of a worry, but I would say so, that, yeah. So it's, it's the Sjogren's thing that's, that sets up for that particular histology or favors that histology, is that the way it works? I think that just in the, in the general sense that Sjogren's syndrome is associated with a lymph proliferation. Right. And the, the prevalence of a low grade marginal zone lymphoma in Sjogren's is greater than the normal population. Okay. Right, in, just in that general sense. I hadn't realized that it was that particular histology of lymphoma that was overrepresented in Sjogren's. I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's the uh, that's the case I wanted to All show. Right. Thanks, David. Howard, you want to go? Okay. Okay, I'm going to show this case, but I'm going to tell you ahead of the time that I'm going to show it in a misleading way, and I know you'll forgive me for that. So here is a CT, these are one millimeter cuts, and I'll just go up there and I'll click the play button so we just scroll down and, and let it go, if I can get it to do that, like that. So as it scrolls down, I think, everyone agree with that this looks like a kind of an unremarkable CT for sure. Nothing jumps out and it looks all right. If anyone has really seen anything, I'd be surprised. So now I'm going to actually show you that somewhat arbitrarily I displayed it with a, with a, where am I here? a window level of minus 373 and a window width of 1152. So let me just click on a more conventional window. And now, which is minus five and 1500. So let me take all that away. Now I'm just gonna go scroll up again. And at this display with these display parameters, I think that, again, the finding is subtle if you, if you don't look at a lot of these or don't have a lot of experience. But basically what we're looking at here are gray lungs. The difference between the blackness of the air in the trachea and the bronchi compared to just the overall background parenchyma is fairly striking, I think. And when we go down here, there is a little bit of mosaic attenuation. But otherwise, I would describe these as gray lungs. And in a person that's symptomatic, has an abnormal DLCO, one thing that one should think of is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So we have a situation where we have cells in the lung parenchyma. Instead of having very discrete centrilobular nodules, the cells are much more diffuse than that and just produce this overall gray lungs. So it turns out that he had a lot of birds at home. He was definitely symptomatic, and a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis was made. This, I think, is incidental mucus right there. And the birds were apparently gotten rid of, and he's doing okay. So now I'll show you the exam I saw the other day, 
And of course, now I'm going to display them at the same window width. And when you're better, you can see how the lungs look gray. They're better inflated, but we don't have this diffuse gray pulmonary hyperattenuation phenomenon. So I'm pretty confident he did have HP and that was abnormal. And I hope you guys agree with my description. And wow. You, and you have some nice examples of the black bronchus sign, like right there on the right lower lobe, superior segment on the original CT, that, that, that bronchus uh, artery pair was nice. The bronchus was too conspicuous. What do you call yeah. it? Black bronchus. Yeah, look at the difference between the you know, the, the current scan and the, the older one. Sort of that you catch the, the you know, those airways right there just are much more conspicuous on the gray lung scan than on the black lung scan. See how far out you can see that airway going sort of about uh, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Yeah. 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 They're just very conspicuous. Yeah, Howard, I think you had some, there's some lobules that were spared or even a little, yeah, probably not air trapping, but in the lower lobes especially, you right. do get yeah. a mosaic attenuation pattern. Yeah. And I, I think your point about the window level is, is definitely a good one. And sometimes we'll even use like narrower, like uh, 600, like minus 600, 1200. So it's even narrower and that may help bring out some of those central lobular nodules even better. Sometimes, but the problem is sometimes if you narrow the window with which I'm doing there, you're going to have a hard time perceiving the diffuse gray lines. Agree. So, yeah. So it's kind of a gotcha. You have to be a bit cautious how you view these images. I don't know why there's a little cystic a little thing there, but this is a narrow window width. Sorry, uh, like this, obviously. And then, yeah. Sorry, I went too far. But you get the idea about the gray lungs. You just have to watch out. I think it's a nice example of that. Yes. I mean, it'd be very easy to blow by this. Yeah. Yeah. I think that little bit of inhomogeneity helps. That's, that's the clue, I think, to get you started thinking about this. Yeah, a little bit. It's like a lobule up here, slightly. A little mosaic attenuation that gives you a little bit of contrast difference to perhaps cue you in but so um howard on the follow-up exam was that yeah. uh that more lucent patch anteriorly in the right lung back Up to here? being normal was that spared lung rather than air trappy lung gosh i don't know how one can tell it's so small isn't it that area up there are you referring to this here yeah Which yeah i can't tell a second it's ago so I would guess it's air trapping because you've got bronchiectasis there, which makes you think there's yeah. airway problems downstream. Okay. Yeah. All righty. This is a nice just anatomy lesson in a way. It's kind of a, a cute case too. I know you guys like these cases. So here is a person that in relation to the finding is not symptomatic from it. It's an imaging finding. And it's also not a new imaging finding. So let me just uh, show you that and just give you a moment to look at this and see if you see anything interesting. Saw this yesterday. So the finding here is related to the trachea and the trachea is displaced rightward. And so the epicenter of the displacement is about here. So instead of it being kind of close to the aortic arch, and sometimes, of course, it will be a little bit rightward when it goes over the aorta, but here there's too much separation, of course, between the aortic arch, the aortic knob, and where the trachea is. So this degree of apparent displacement is a little bit too much. So let me bring the lateral projection now. And this is from before, alongside. And if we take a look to where the trachea is, can you perceive anything? I'll bring it up there. And it's kind of subtle, but now I'm going to bring up a thick slab recon from the sagittal to show you where that thing is, which is 
here, so kind of subtle here, partly in red is triangle, but it's here too. And it's this thing, of course, right here that is there. And now I'll just bring up the regular coronal and sagittal to show you this is thyroid tissue. So in this particular person, it actually doesn't displace the trachea up higher, which is usually the case, but just coming down the left side, here it's relatively sparse and then it gets bulgy right there and then really pushes the trachea and the esophagus over. So that's thyromegaly coming down in mediastinum doing that. Here is a thyroid scan I found from some time ago and here's some thyroid tissue coming down. They did offer this person some more evaluation but he's about 90 years old and I think he wisely declined any further intervention because this is not doing him any harm. So kind of a cute case of intrathoracic thyroid with somewhat unusual displacement of the trachea, at least in terms of where this thyroid tissue is going. Just a cute case. All righty, those are my cases, Jeff. All right, thank you. All right, I'll sh I have four and then we can probably get back to, um, to Travis. Let's see, I want to stop. All right, there we go. All right, so um, this is something I noticed, I haven't noticed in the past, I know at least that I recall. So this patient, uh, I'll show you the old scan first. Um, this patient had a lobectomy for a early stage lung cancer, and that's not why I'm showing it. Um, it was this, where did it go? Here's the right one, yeah. Had a right lower lobectomy for this little guy, and a mediastinal lymph node dissection done via VATS, the usual, usual thing. And this was the base. This was the original scan, and then we were just doing the about six, seven months out first post-operative. Jeff, I think that you're not showing the. We're seeing the database screen, I believe, really? rather than really? the view. Well, that's a problem. Let's try this again. Do you see? Yep, now we do. Good. All right. Now we see it. Okay. Start over. Okay. So this patient had a little right lower lobe cancer that was resected, VATS, mediastinal lymph node dissection. And then this was the scan done for the purposes of surveillance, you know, typical uh, done six months afterwards. And shows what you'd expect after a lobectomy. But what we saw, what was interesting is we noticed that, where do I hear it? this new sort of low attenuation structure in the right high paratracheal space. And it's different than these normal lymph nodes. And this was a stage 1A, so there were no positive lymph nodes. And you know, you and one could potentially mistaken this for lymphadenopathy uh, and recurrence, uh, it, but it measured water attenuation. And if you go back to the preoperative CT, which I'll bring in next to it, let's see if I can, um, may not let me separate them out. So, you know, I've lost my scroller bar. There we go. It, there was nothing there at that location. So um, my presumption is this is a lymphocele because they did resect a bunch of nodes in the right paratracheal region and not a necrotic lymph node. Uh, it's homogeneous, measures water. And um, I don't know, I've not seen, I think I may have seen one in the past, but didn't think much about it. But I don't know, have any of you ever seen a postoperative lymphocele following a lymphadenectomy in the mediastinum? I uh, don't think so. Makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, so we'll see it again next time they follow these routinely. Um, but, you know, with a little cancer, negative margins, no nodes, um, and it just looks different than, you know, we still have normal lymph nodes here. They're denser. And so, yep. yeah. So I think it's a lot of all, and we'll see what it does in three months. But my guess is um, it'll probably hang out for a while, may stay there forever, may go away. The only thing I've seen that's similar to that, somewhat similar, is a case or two of a patient that had mediastinoscopy and the surgeon, maybe because of bleeding, controlled the bleeding with Surgicel. And Surgicel, the material, can hold water and even some gas. And then you can get a post-operative fluid collection that might look even like an abscess. But the ones that I've seen are usually larger than that and more worrisome than that. 
Yeah, and this yeah. one's very clean and well circumscribed. And as far as I know, with reading the op note, because I was kind of confirming that they actually did a, which nodes they took, there was no mention of any bleeding or anything in the media. Yeah, yeah right, Air, Air Howard. Those usually do have foci of air in them, and sometimes you people yeah, mistake them or think they might be retained sponges, but it's just the surgicil or surgicil. Is yeah. that a gel like uh, the stuff that's in in uh, disposable diapers or something? It soaks up fluid. It's like a little it foam. Is. You know, I've seen it placed. It's and it it's um causes it's almost like yeah, it causes hemostasis. It almost looks like styrofoam, but if it's not because it will reabsorb. But they just place it next to bleeding areas, and it will cause hemostasis. It's great if you ever cut yourself shaving. It, it does a good job. All right. Um, so this is an interesting case. So this is a patient, a young man who has papillary thyroid carcinoma. And as I scroll here, you can see there's tiny scattered little nodules, which may, as you're scrolling through, I think you'll see them, but it doesn't look, if you just are zipping through really quickly or, or less experienced, initially you may not appreciate them. Um, this case also shows the value of MIPS. When you see the MIPS, you realize just how many little nodules there actually are. And that's very typical of papillary thyroid cancer, you know, one of the ones that can give you a miliary pattern. But what's interesting about this case is I have a radioiodine study that's re fairly contemporaneous, and this is quite striking. So this is all I-131 uptake in the lungs. These are planar images. And then these are the SPECT images, and you can see just how intense it is. So there is probably microscopic disease that we can't even see, but that's where all the that's where all the Mets are, and then these are just the rest of the coronals. But this was one of the more intense cases I've seen with this much radioiodine in the lungs. You know, uh, so that's where most of the dose is going. You can see a little bit still in the in the neck and the probably up in the sinuses or something that excretes in the bladder. But you know, going back to this, you can see that. We just, there's tiny little nodules everywhere. So there's probably, it's just probably the aggregate of all the tumor that we can't resolve by CT giving you that uptake. Oh. Yep. Very impressive. Yep. All right, Travis, this one's for you. Daniela showed me this case this morning. So this is um, a patient who was seen in the emergency department, short of breath, chest pain, rule out PE. And you can see the bolus isn't great. It's a larger patient. Um, but there's this sort of filling defect, branching right here. It's got straight edges, goes into the vessel. Um, now clearly there's some smoke going on down here in other areas. There's a lot of flow artifact in here, but this one, I think, I think fairly it, when, um, I don't, I, I let's see, I think if you put an, if I remember the ROI, it wasn't as high as one would think. Yeah. It's only a mean of 28, 27. So it's not very, very high like we typically see with smoke. Um, but so it wasn't called definitively, but was questioned, I think rightfully so. So uh, we had suggested a VQ scan because the lungs were, were fine, but uh, we did end up doing an MRA instead, which we do a lot of. So it's not a big deal around here to get a good MRA. But what we see is it's, it's a negative study. There's, that's the area in question. I'll make an axial out of it just to put them side by side. Oops right tool here but you can see in that area of question there's no it's all just smoke wow that's even yeah that's awfully low attenuation that's pretty yeah, interesting i think i think you have to at least question that i, I don't think i would be comfortable yeah given it has a straight edge it doesn't have that wispy i mean the only thing lacking is the it's not really dilated here but you don't really understand see how far out it could go um and there was nothing else to go by so occasionally there's a little pitfall and even you have low attenuation in this vessel too. You know, and we don't use a hard and fast cutoff, but you know, this was clearly looks like an interrupted bolus and, you know, we got 125 in the PA, which is enough to see a clot. So yeah, the order wow. 235. So yeah, but I thought you'd like that one. Nice one. 
all right, and then this is kind of a cool case. So this is an elderly woman um, in her 80s, late 80s, I believe, uh, who has known longstanding bronchiectasis and came in with some chest pain or something. And this was a PE study done for this. And instantly detected was this big guy right here coming off this large, these tortuous and very large bronchial arteries. So that's yeah, about a 12, 13 millimeter bronchial artery aneurysm. And you can see how big these arteries are. And then you see them in the subcranial space crossing the right hilum as well. I'll show you her lungs. I need to see, I mean, just long standing. I, I couldn't figure out anywhere. I was going through the chart to figure out why she has bronchiectasis. I don't think it's ever been worked out. It's not MAC. Um, it could be a lot of things, aspiration, some immune deficiency. But the question, I guess, is what do you do with it? Um, I think you could argue, well, it's been here probably for some time. She's in her late 80s, has some comorbidities, probably worth just leaving alone. Um, alternatively, you, the question was, could you, would you treat this percutaneous embo it? Uh, trans arterially or not. I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of data on it or what the, what one would do. I mean, ones out in the lung may be more likely to rupture than ones tucked away in the mediastinum. I don't know. What, do you guys have any experience with this? No, no. I think it was me. I would say, leave me alone. I'll yeah. go play some golf. That, that's kind of the consensus. <laughs> at least among us in the chest room that probably would just leave it alone because it's been there for some time and she's not having hemoptysis from this. So, all right. Well, that's all I have this week. Uh, we've got a little bit more time. Travis, if you want to show some more. Okay. Yeah, you should see my database screen. I'm going to pull up something really quick. So this is, a slide that my colleague Kim Kalianas sent me. She's listening here. This is a, from one of her talks. This was all Surgicel or other bioabsorbable packing material placed after aortic surgery. And you can see there's little foci probably gas if you were windowing this with a lung window and six weeks later it's gone. I looked it up really quick. But most of these are made out of cellulose. So it's something that's absorbable and it just causes hemostasis. But certainly that one looks a little bit more you know, mass like they must have just put a big wad of it in there yeah. all right now this one i'm curious what everybody thinks this is a, a patient who's 49 as you can see he has end-stage liver disease and he has a tips and he was being referred for lung or for liver transplant and this was an outside study and it's kind of interesting because you see in his right lower lobe that he has these medial areas of consolidation and it's continuous but they right there is next to a big osteophyte and right here is reasonably next to an osteophyte and so i was reading this because this was an outside study and they said there was these areas of consolidation unfortunately i didn't have any priors i did find in the chart that it reportedly it had a normal chest ct three months before this so i thought maybe it was most likely was going to just be some sort of, you know, I don't know, I didn't know if it was mechanical next to the osteophytes like we see, but it's pretty impressive when you look at it on the, on a sagittal reformat because it's so continuous. Um, but since he's a liver transplant candidate, they want to make sure it's not cancer. I didn't think it was just based on the reasons I gave before. So they did a follow-up this week or last week, and you can see that even a month later, it's just, now you're left with a more typical osteophyte fibrosis with just a little bit of linear reticulation and ground glass. So that was over the course of a month. So I have no idea. I don't know if this is, if these are areas of, of hemorrhage or like a, some sort of acute trauma next to these. I'm curious if you guys have any suggestions on, or on what you think it is. And, Cause it's so contiguous, it's so contiguous with these osteophytes. And he didn't have any, um, like compression fracture that happened at the time that may have ripped the lung or something. No, there was no history of trauma. This was just a like cirrhosis follow-up. Because he's cirrhotic. Okay, no, his spine looks pretty good there. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering maybe he was maybe his INR was elevated and this is just hemorrhage. You know, minor trauma and hemorrhage. I don't know. I mean, it's just, but I think it's. I don't know if we just caught more active inflammation or active mechanical forces from these things or what. But it's, 
clearly not cancer. And yeah. I mean, sure, he could have yeah. aspirated, but just to have it right next to here would, you know, doesn't make much sense either. So, I don't know, I was curious. No, yeah. that is very strange. Okay, so you guys don't have any other, you know. Doesn't ring any bells. Yeah. No. Other than this is, I mean, this, if you just see this most more recent one, you just don't ignore this because it's next to those osteophytes. Just curious that there was more of an acute component to it. So, okay. Well, at least he can get his transplant with no worries now. I'm gonna show two cases that both came in within a month of each other, same thing. Occasionally we see chest wall tumors and bone tumors, and I think it's important to recognize these. They're, these are both outside studies. 68 year old who underwent a chest radiograph for some other reason, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but it was unrelated and they found this mass undergoes CT and you can see that it is arising from or involving the, the ribs. And I think you'd say it's probably arising from the rib because you can see this cortex, the posterior cortex of this rib near the costal, the costochondral junction is a little you know, irre irregular and elevated here. So it certainly looks like there's some sort of bone or cartilaginous matrix here. She also had a pleural effusion on that side. And so we've shown occasional bone tumors. It doesn't look like a uh, fibrous dysplasia or an aneurysmal bone cyst because it looks like it's arising you know, from the, the cortex or adjacent to it. So this turned out to be, this was a chondrosarcoma. And what's interesting is it involves two of the, I think this one extended to involve, yeah, two of the ribs. And she's the one, I have two of these now. The other one I'll show you is the same. I can't remember. I think that she actually may be the one, yeah, she had pleural effusions and she actually had metastatic tumor deposits in the pleura and along the diaphragm, which you don't really see on the CT. But this is a, a low-grade chondrosarcoma and they actually decided in tumor board not to do anything systemic, even though she had these visible deposits on the, on, at surgery. So I pull up this article and I share it just because I think it's, it's a nice review of different rib lesions you can see. But when you see chondrosarcoma, that they're the most common primary malignant rib neoplasm, they usually arise right at that costochondral junction or near the chondro, costochondral junction, usually middle age. So this lady, you know, she kind of fits all of the rules. And then we had this next one that came in around the same time. This was, I guess, a couple months ago. But similar appearance, mass on the left side. You can see it has a little bit of an incomplete border. Unfortunately, I didn't have a preoperative radiograph, but you can see it's anteriorly as well. And so this is a guy that looks almost identical arising from the left side. Just a little bit of you know, some matrix in here, and it looks like it's kind of lifting that that bone or rising from that inner cortex there. So this one also came out and also was a chondrosarcoma. So two chondrosarcomas in, in, a, in the course of a couple months. So the most common rib ne malignant rib neoplasm right along that, along the costochondral junction. They look identical to each other. They are yeah. just the identical. It's just yeah. that the lady was so unlucky because of that pleural spread. My gosh. Yeah, exactly. And they, yeah, and like I said, they, but it's low grade, so they're just going to watch it and see. And I'll, I'll finish with this one, which I think is just a, a really pretty case of a nice differential and something that we occasionally see. But this is another middle aged person who came in with a right pleural effusion. She had some B symptoms. And you can see, even on this non contrast study, not only is there a right pleural effusion, but she has this confluent pair of vertebral soft tissue, and it kind of drapes over the vertebral bodies, and it's both sides. And so, of course, in the posterior mediastinum, which a lot of this is, or the paravertebral space, certainly you have to think about lymphadenopathy or extramedullary metapoiesis or other you know, things of the of the of the um, lymph nodes, or or of of some sort of you know some sort of myeloid elements or something. She TB actually, or yeah. What's that? TB or coxy. Or, right, or some sort of granulomatous infection, yeah. So she had this, then they did a contrast-enhanced study. You can see it extends into the paraspinal muscles too, but 
it lifts the aorta off the off the spine, kind of like you see in the in the retroperitoneum when you have you know tumor like lymphoma. So some sort of like soft tumor here or infection. She also so has this actually anteriorly, anteriorly in the mediastinal fat anteriorly there too. Yeah, she has a what looks like a cardiophrenic node there. Great. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. And she also had some enlarged axillary lymph nodes. So we told them to go after the axillary nodes rather than, you know, before they went to try and biopsy this paravertebral stuff. And so they did a biopsy of her axillary node, a core biopsy, and this did turn out to be a small B cell lymphoma. So it's all just lymphoma lifting up and just kind of confluent in the posterior mediastinum here. So yeah, but thank you, David, yeah, for pointing out these other areas of involvement. And I, I think she may have had a little bit of retroperitoneal involvement, I don't remember for sure, but it was mostly just this paravertebral posterior mediastinal stuff. Did you say what the histology was? It was a, it's a small B-cell lymphoma, CD10 okay. positive. Was there, a, was there a specific thing you were thinking of? No. Or, so, no. okay. But yeah, just something we occasionally see in the posterior mediastinum. And I, I should point out too that, and that she had a spine MR because we, you know, whenever you have stuff draped along the paravertebral region, it's always important to look in the central canal. And she did have some areas of narrowing. As you can see, there was, there was soft tissue and tumor extending into the central canal at multiple levels. I think you can kind of window it and see this is all enhancing soft tissue posteriorly and then just a small central mm -hmm. canal yeah space there so yeah okay jeff i think that's enough for for me today yeah. thank you everybody all right well great cases and we'll talk to you next week thanks, thanks everyone thanks bye, -bye. bye.